Number 22, Gilbane versus St. Paul Fire and Marine Insurance. Council? Uh, may, may it please the court, Richard Brown on behalf of appellants. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to reserve three minutes. Three, sir? Uh, yes. You may. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, appellants have, have pro offered three alternative arguments. Uh, for relief here, each sufficient on its own uh, to warrant the order of the appellate division vacated. Uh, the first of which is that a plain reading of the liberty endorsement language itself uh, requires only that the named insured enter into a written agreement or written contract uh, in which it agreed to provide appellant's coverage. And so what, what does here. with whom mean? What is the meaning of with whom? Uh, I mean, you agree it's, it's an awkward sentence it is it is the 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 language that's actually employed here and it is a manuscript endorsement by used by liberty here uh the language that's employed is 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 cumbersome as your honor states uh the language with whom in and of itself although it implies uh an agreement direct agreement that language in and of itself does not create the express requirement that uh, both parties, the parties seeking additional insured coverage, having entered into a direct contract with the named insured. Does it have any meaning at all in the sentence under your reading? Uh, of course. Uh, with whom uh, seemingly, seemingly pertains to uh, both the named insured as well as the additional insured and that they, they come to an agreement, uh, which we do have here well, if we, by the if terms... We if we struck the word with, wouldn't it then mean exactly what you're saying? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I believe so. So you're ascribing uh, no meaning to the word with? Not necessarily. What I do believe is that without the word with, uh, the language actually employed is, is more precise and actually uh, effectuates the, the, but, but it, the meaning of But it seems like the, you're equating what you consider to be bad grammar with ambiguity. I don't think we've ever said that. Uh, I don't believe that bad grammar itself creates an ambiguity. What we have here are essentially the appellate division has taken the phrase with whom mm -hmm. and the remote phrase of by written contract and read together created by implication this condition that both parties have entered into a direct written contract. So is there any limitation on who you could enter the written contract with? I mean, could it be anyone and you just agree with some third party to provide insurance? So that's how you would read this? In fact, that's how uh, such blanket additional insured endorsements typically operate. So any operate. third party, I can enter into an agreement and I say, I'm going to, party C, I have a written agreement with party C, I'm going to insure party A. And that's enough under here, even though party may not even know it. That, that's typically the circumstances uh, under which these blanket additional insured or endorsements operate. That's one interpretation, or it seems, and I think what these questions have been saying is, it seems pretty clear on its face that a much more logical reading of the plain language of this is with whom you have agreed by written contract, which would mean you have an obligation to go out and contract with this third party insured, which doesn't that seem to make a lot more commercial sense and actually fit with the plain language of the contract here? I agree, Your Honor. However, that's not what the language <laughs> says. And what we do have here is a situation where Liberty took it upon themselves uh, uh, unilaterally to draft this language. And the case law clearly states that under these circumstances, it needs to be construed against the drafter. Well, not if and it's isn't clear. It, is, I'm sorry. Isn't it your, your, your argument? that um, there's no requirement, no matter how we read this, there's no requirement that the insurer know who, who was contracted with. In other words, even if, um, even if uh, um, the, the, the insurer, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, even if the insured had contracted with the purported uninsured, right? There's no requirement that that the insurer be notified of that in any way. That's what you You're mean correct, by a Your blanket. Honor. And and the provision. next step in that 
in that statement there is there's no further analysis of risk or further premium charged, even if we accept the carriers and the appellate division's interpretation, there would be no further notification that goes to the insurer uh, regarding any of these parties that are, are added uh, as additional There insurance. could be one or there could be 10 or there could be 500. Correct. It, it's, it's covered no matter <coughs> who the contracts are. And what's typically done is an insurer will do their risk assessment based on the volume of, of work uh, typically done by their insured. Uh, they'll do their risk assessment at the time. They'll, uh, they'll calculate the associated premium and they'll issue a blanket additional insured endorsement. This is, this is- So they never request to see the agreements? Uh, no, Your Honor. No, Your Honor, not in typical course. But isn't it something of a check for the insurance company to require the insurer to enter a written contract with each person that they intend to extend this insurance towards. I mean, isn't that arguably how you would read what they're bargaining for here? So that you don't have situations where you have a third party contract insuring somebody else, at least there's a clear cut relationship between their insured and the third party insured. So you may not have to notify them, and it may be unlimited number of people who could fall within this clause, but at least the primary insurer has some control in terms of you, the insured, must contract individually with the people that you want covered by this contract. Well, Your Honor, essentially the insurer is at the control at all points as far as the coverage, the scope of coverage, and, and those limitations. And in particular, in this case, Liberty had the opportunity to use the 2033 form, uh, which is you know, arguably, uh, courts have found that it expressly requires a direct written contract. This form was available at the time. Liberty chose not to use it. Instead, they chose to draft this manuscript language and include it on the policy. Uh, so again, going back to your point, it's, it's well within a carrier's right and ability to limit that coverage. Uh, in this circumstance, they did not. Council, each of you have asked us to consider cases in which uh, similar endorsements were uh, used. Is there a particular case that you think uh, points up your argument? Uh, I believe um, the more recent case, it's actually a Southern District case, uh, Liberty Mutual Fire Insurance versus Zurich. Uh, extremely uh, on point in terms of the factual underpinnings of the case itself and the, the particular endorsement at issue. Um, and basically what the endorsement said there was, uh, any person or organization with whom you have agreed through written contract, agreement, or permit to provide additional insured coverage. Very similar to what we have here. Any person or organization with whom you have agreed to add as an additional insured by written contract. Can I just uh, follow up on, on one point, Judge? Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, the certificate of insurance listed the joint venture on it, didn't it? That is correct. Okay. So uh, if this, uh, is it material if the plain language is clear? Does the certificate of insurance matter or does it only matter in cases where there's an ambiguity? So in other words, does, it, does our analysis just go back to a plain language analysis and we ignore the, and if we say plain language is you lose and you lose, or um, are we required to read them together? There, there's uh, a few different issues Go involved ahead. there. If, if the court does see that the language itself is plain on its face mm -hmm. as requiring a direct contract, I would say that there is another argument that involves the certificate of insurance. Uh, how, how do we get to that if there's no ambiguity? Uh, because what the court would then be saying is that a direct written contract would be necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, so my following argument would be that uh, there was uh, writing that was, that was sent to Samson uh, requiring that their certificate of insurance uh, indicating that the JV itself be added as an additional insured be updated. And there is a subsequent writing going back to the JV from Samson CEO saying, as requested, uh, please find attach our updated certificates of insurance indicating the JV as an additional insured. I see. Uh, so the argument would follow that these writings combined with the uh, underlying contracts entered into with DASNY 
uh, together form the written contract required uh, by the endorsement itself. Perfect. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Council? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, George Harden for the respondent, Liberty Internet, Liberty Insurance Underwriters, LIU. Council, um, your position in Zurich that you took in the Southern District? Well, um, that was a parent, uh, an affiliate, and that position, if I might add, did not um, really result in any discussion whatsoever by the court. Uh, it is a different company, Your Honor, um, and uh, the positions ascribed in that case, as you know, we do not ascribe to here. We are a different company. Um, that decision, as well as the other two decisions in Plaza Construction and American Home, do not discuss whatsoever the significance or the meaning of with whom you have agreed. There is no appreciation and no acknowledgement that with whom you have agreed is descriptive of the person or organization who is to be added as an additional insured. What about appellant, uh, counsel for the appellant's argument that you could have used clear language in a form that would have gotten this done for you and you chose not to do it? I find this uh, language quite clear. Uh, you look at the dissent's criticism of this language, they criticize syntax and the use of the infinitive. When you look at the syntax, which is position of the words, uh, they would suggest that it would be clearer uh, or somehow different if you took the phrase uh, in a written contract and juxtaposed it in the sentence to well, follow it, it, agreed. Isn't the question, it, though, what an average insured would think? And, and when I think about this, I think, okay, there are these, these, these big companies that are involved in this project in this particular case, right? But this will also, what we decide here will also apply to, you know, the little one-person subcontractor, right? So, so and, and anything in between. And so, we, what, is it that clear? To me, it doesn't seem like it would be that clear to the average insured. Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, if I said to the average insured, uh, so this is the person or organization that we're going to add as an additional insured. We're going to add the person or organization with whom you have agreed to add as an additional insured in a written contract. Everything that follows um, person or organization are phrases, descriptive phrases, identifying who the additional insured is to be. And but, whether but, you but take- given, given, given the, the practice in the industry, as it's been explained to us, um, what, what is the purpose of, um, of requiring the writing to be between the insured and with this blanket type of... of uh, As His Honor has suggested, it is underwriting control. Uh, the underwriter it, has to manage the risk and confine the risk to those entities with whom the named insured has a legitimate business interest and a business relationship. But isn't that uh, it's established? To prevent can't them that, from can't naming that be established 500 here people. With Samson? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Can't that be established here with Dasney and Samson? I mean, doesn't that establish that it's a legitimate business relationship? But that's not suggestive that anybody that Dasney wants to be added to our policy should be added. We respond and explain to the court in our reply brief to the Turner Construction public policy arguments the other endorsements that were available if Samson and its broker wanted coverage for insureds beyond those with whom it contracted. Those endorsements were not requested here. Our underwriter was not told what how other- how does that change the risk? I mean- If the underwriter's not told, no, no. Who else is if, to you, be if you have a blanket endorsement that says anybody that you contract with, okay, to, to provide this insurance, we're going to cover. You don't have to tell us who it is. It could be one person, it could be 10, it could be 500. It doesn't matter, okay. But the underwriter asks what the project is always when you apply for well, a policy of course, like that. Of course. So here's a project, and, but 
I, how does, I, I don't understand how having that contract between those two parties specifically changes the analysis of your risk. I see. Um, so in that instance, um, the underwriter naturally from the application knows the business of the insured, knows the type of work that they do. And so um, when they have that information, they can assess what the risk factors would be for adding an upstream entity uh, that uh, will uh, retain the named insured for that type of work. There's no question but here that that's, that's who you have here. I mean, you have an upstream en entity, right? Gilbane is a construction manager. They have liability beyond the excavation foundation uh, contractor. They have liability whether they are uh, acknowledge it or not, for all of the other contractors on that site. The construction manager has to schedule the work. It has to, whether they realize it or not, but oversee the work. But isn't that always true of upstream folks? But that's not something my underwriter should undertake the uh, coverage for. Oh, so you're saying that you only want to cover downstream? I only want to cover DASNY. That's the entity with whom I contracted and according to the wording of the endorsement, I cover them only for liability arising out of my operations. You don't so the know risk how many is my operation. You don't know how many people contracted. Is that, is that your no, practice? No, I know. I asked those, inf I asked those why questions. Why wouldn't you make the kind of, why, why have a blanket endorsement then? Why not just, why not just have it for DASNY? Want, don't, want that would be, that would be wonderful. We could have done that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, before, ISO started developing these endorsements, Your Honor. That's how business was done. And you'll find today, um, many times in the construction industry and elsewhere, endorsements that specifically identify the entities to be added as an additional insured. So that's really something that we could have accomplished if, had, if we had been asked. Can you address counsel's argument about the um, certificate of insurance? About, I'm sorry. About the certificate of insurance. Yes. The certificate of insurance, um, first of all, was not issued to Gilbane. The certificate of insurance was issued to DASNY. And the certificate of insurance was sent to Gilbane at their request. They said, can you send us the certificate of insurance? The, if I may, just uh, impose on the court, the, the forwarding letter simply says, per your request, here's the current certificate of insurance. I'm referring to the record at 914 and 915, and 916 and 917. I thought and at just, 917 that JV was identified as an additional insured. That's correct, but look what this certificate says, Your Honor, that was sent to Gilbert. I don't have it in front of me. Go ahead, you tell me. Um, this certificate is issued as a matter of information only and confers no rights upon the certificate holder this certificate does not amend, extend, or alter the coverage afforded by the policies below. So, so then what, this is, this is so, so then what was referred to in the dissent is not an actual certificate of insurance. Is that what you're saying? And was not issued by LIU. I see. Typically in the industry, almost always, brokers issue this. And a broker, under the case law, is the agent of the insured. So if Samson's broker did not look at the endorsement and did not look at the policy when uh, it was issued and decides to issue this type of document, they have an issue. I'm sorry, just to be clear. So it, when you issued the policy, you didn't know at that time how many additional insureds there were because you didn't know how many, if any, <laughs> entities the insured had entered an agreement with? That's correct, but we would know the project. Okay, so you're saying that, I understand that back and forth with Judge Steins, that that is how you assess risk. You know the project and you base it on the project. And the, and the, and the business of the insured applying for coverage. So We know they're an excavation contractor. So could, could the insured have entered one of these agreements after the policy was entered into? or it's only what exists at the time you enter the policy with DASI? No, it's conceivable they could have entered a contract after the issuance so if during the effective uh, period of this policy. I acknowledge what the court says. Um, but again, 
the Are you saying that wouldn't change the, the scope of the project because you've insured the project and somehow that well, can't we, change the with wording, the addition of someone? It's the wording that says, but only for liability arising out of your operations. So uh -huh. that would be whatever project that Samson um, contracted for mm -hmm. with whatever additional insured. Mm -hmm. But understand that um, this certificate is not a contract. This letter is sent a year later after that contract was entered. And I only read one segment of this uh, certificate. There are three other places where it says this does not convey coverage and, and this is not uh, in any way um, indicative of what the policy says. Thank you, Council. Thank you all. Council? Uh, just wanted to make <clears throat> excuse me, a few additional points. Uh, regarding the certificate itself, the significance really uh, arises out of the letter that it's sent with uh, from Sampson to the JV. And that letter, again, is in response to a request for an updated certificate indicating that uh, the JV itself has additional insured coverage. The same day, Samson responds with the letter uh, with the accompanying COI attached. Uh, the letter itself recognizes this obligation. And again, what the significance is, is that it, it, it establishes, uh, as discussed previously, that there is, in fact, a written contract between the parties, between the named insured and the JV. Just wanted to clarify that point. Also, uh, with respect to uh, any contracts that could be entered into after the policy is issued, that's very much the case. It goes on all the time. This policy was not uh, limited to this particular project at all. Uh, it just so happens that we had the contract itself pre-existing the policy here. And in that circumstance where there's a late added additional insurer, does the coverage run from the moment of the addition or it dates back to the beginning of the insurance policy? Uh, the, the additional insured coverage would run back to the date that that contract uh, in which the named insured promised that coverage was effectively uh, created. So you could enter into a written contract now, today, and it would run back to the beginning of the project? That's your view? Uh, well, there are other time limitations associated with, with the policy itself um, that would limit that coverage, limit the risk to the insurer. Halfway through the job, you could have. Very much so. Enter into a completely separate contract related to a, a wholly uh, separate project. If we disagree with you, there is recourse, is there not? Excuse me, Your Honor? If we disagree with you, is there not some other form of recourse available? Uh, Someone else that can be sued? Contrary to, uh, contrary to the majority's opinion, I, don't do, I do not believe so. Uh, Why not? Because what we have here is a situation that the named insured Sampson effectively carried out and, and, and uh, sought to obtain the coverage and understood the coverage that was being provided actually fulfilled its contractual obligations. Uh, and, you know, practically speaking, what, what occurs is you have an entity such as Samson or another contractor that is not financially viable in those situations to cover the risks associated with but such assuming projects. assuming Samson is viable, the fact that, that if we disagree with you, which means that Samson didn't fulfill its duty because it didn't provide you with that coverage, isn't that, isn't that? Uh, another, issue, another issue arises that, you know, within the construction industry itself, this is, this is often what, what occurs in terms of contracts and the allocation of risk. W what the intent is to really shift that risk to the party that is actually performing the work. Uh, not the owner or, in this case, the construction manager. Um, so in, in this case in particular, we have numerous different prime, uh, prime subcontractors that are involved and uh, a situation where, again, the owner was actually contracting with these parties. And if, if the court were to disagree with, with appellant's interpretation, what they would need to do in that situation is effectively enter into an endless amount of contracts which would completely frustrate the risk transfer process and almost eliminate parties, upstream parties' ability to do so. Um, one other point that I wanted to make regarding the, the Zurich case itself, 
The council stated that the, uh, the language that we have here employed in the AI endorsement wasn't actually considered. I just wanted to quickly uh, read an excerpt from that decision. The court states that while other courts have reached a contrary interpretation of similar policy language, the court declines to follow them because they add a requirement of direct contractual privity between the named insured and the purported additional insured that does not exist in the policy language. And again, we have nearly identical policy language here uh, as in this Zurich decision. Thank you, counsel. Thank you.